one of our keynote speaker series. Thank you for coming. Lots of familiar faces again, which is wonderful, and some new ones as well. Just wanted to have um, a quick little wave from our fundraising and marketing coordinator, Lena Straub. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's Hello, going everybody. to be putting all of our keynote speaker series onto our website. So if there's something you just wanted to back up on, mm -hmm. on this talk, you could watch it again, or if there's someone that you thought would get a really good benefit out of this talk, please share it with them. Uh, also, I'd like Amelia Davis, who's in the back, if you could just give a wave. Amelia has just joined us um, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, she is our new manager here at NSMP Canterbury. So if you have some time to say hello, give her, give her a little nod. Some housekeeping for you guys. If you haven't been with us before, we have emergency exits, which would be the first the way that you walked in. And then also this door here. So any rumbles, grumbles, um, or heat, off we go. <laughs> if you need to use the restroom, please just head straight across. If you've brought a cellular phone, if you could put it on silent now, we'd really appreciate that. So today, our keynote speaker is Dr. Matthew Croucher. Matthew is a mental health specialist doctor working at Berwyn Hospital. He has a particular interest in multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's, lucky us. <laughs> He's held academic roles at the University of Otago, Christchurch, and is the founder and director of the CDHP, Psychiatry of Old Age Academic Unit which provides teaching, training, research, management, advice in the older person's mental health sector. So if you can join me and uh, welcome you to this talk. Wow. Uh, here again, it's lovely to see you all. Thank you for coming. Um, so those things that you've heard about me are not the most important things for me. Okay. So the most important things about me, I'm a, I was born here, but I'm really a Nelson boy, so Croucher is uh, not a common name in New Zealand, but it's a Nelson name for my branch of the family. So it's my granddad's granddad that climbed off one of the early ships in the 19th century, and we've made our home there since, so that's where I grew up, really. But it's quite funny working at Burwood Hospital now, because I was born in Burwood Hospital. <laughs> Some of you may remember there was a Burwood mm -hmm. unit yes. there. Yes. I remember it, not because I was born in it, but because <laughs> when I had a house officer job as a junior doctor, and you were doing night duty, your little room to try and go to sleep was right underneath the birthing unit. So, <laughs> you know, lots of babies arrive at about 3 o'clock in the morning, don't yeah. they? So um, that wasn't the best place to sleep. So Burwood Hospital is kind of home in a lot of ways. It's odd, isn't it? Uh, so I work here now. And I've brought up my own kids here in Christchurch. So my wee boys, I've got Mr. 21 and Mr. 18 now, and they're both bigger than me, but you all know how that happens. <laughs> you know, with children and nieces and nephews, they, they grow quicker than you think, don't they? So those are some of the most important things about me. Another important thing about me is that, like many of us in this room, I've had to go through an episode or two of depression. So all of us, it's part of the human condition, isn't it, that we feel down at times. So no one in this room has gone through their lives without feeling down at times. But about one in three humans living on the planet will experience a time of, of really being unwell as an illness is not a bad way to think about it when it gets really bad and it sets in. It's different from just being down. And probably more than one in three of us in this room have experience of that because there are some folks here who have lived with, who are living with multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease or uh, the care partners, the family care partners of someone else who's living with multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease, and that puts all of us at higher risk for lots of reasons. 
So in this room, perhaps more than one in three have had to do that. So you're like me, and you've had to have an episode or two or more of that in your life. And some of us in this room may be in the pit of depression right now. And if you are, take my hat off to you. Well done for coming here to even hear it being talked about. Because it's not easy being in the pit, to put it mildly. I do want to make another special shout out though to people who might not realise that they're actually standing or sitting in the pit of depression, but by the end of this talk you think, goodness me, perhaps I am. So there's a special shout out to you, and the public health announcement is, if at the end of this talk you're feeling a bit worried about that, don't, don't just hold on to it by yourself. Find someone today or over the weekend that knows you really well that you trust and just have a chat to them about it and don't just sit on it by yourself. All right. This is not a talk about science. This is a practical talk about how it is that some of us have slid into this pit before or might slide into it in the future. But more to the point, how all of us can try and protect ourselves and build ourselves up to make it less likely that we'll slide in. That's something that all of us could do with, fair enough. Um, but if we do find ourselves in the pit, how do you get out again? And all those messages are the same. So I'm talking to you about it partly from experience, because I've been in the pit and climbed out a number of times, but partly from the science of it, because I know about what, what do studies tell us, and what does medical experience and psychotherapy experience over the years and years tell us about how to get out of this this state. And most of it is not rocket science, but it's hard yakka, so it's helpful to have a few uh, really tidy ways of thinking about it. And I find thinking about it as a pit, how do you fall in, how do you climb out, is a really tidy way of just reminding ourselves uh, how to avoid this and if we're in it, how to get out, and if we're looking at someone else, how to help them out extend their hand and help them out. So I hope that by the end of today you have some practical ideas that you think, actually that could help me, or that could help this other person I know, or that's a way I could build myself up more than I'm already doing to look after myself. I hope so. That's the point of today. So it's practical and it's from experience. But it's also from my experience as a doctor, isn't it? Because that's my job. I spend a lot of time meeting with people who are actually in this pit, and they're in it bad. You know, you've got to be in it fairly bad to see me, <laughs> yeah? because it's hard to get in the door of my clinic, because there's just so many people that want to see me. So that's awful. If, you know, if you're in the pit that bad that you have to see me, I really, that's sad. Um, but I've had experience of helping people climb out that's another type of personal experience that I'm bringing, which I hope is helpful for you. All right. <coughs> I wonder if any of you have read or heard of Pilgrim's Progress. Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting book, very old-fashioned, um, uh, written back in the 17th century. Very Christian kind of story. It's about the Pilgrim, John Pilgrim and his progress through life, and it's all a big metaphor for the Christian life. That's basically what it's about. But at one point, John Pilgrim falls into a slough of despond, which is kind of like a pit of depression. He says, Now in my dream, I saw that they drew near to a very miry slough. Bit an old word, isn't it? You don't hear slough anymore as a word for bog, except for the, all those poor people that actually live in slough. <laughs> anyway, this slough was in the midst of the plain, and they, being heedless, did both fall suddenly into the bog. The name of the slough was Despond. And 
here, therefore, they wallowed for a while, being grievously bedaubed with the dirt. And Christian, because of the burden that was on his back, began to sink in the mire. And then said Pliable, the friend of Christian, who's also fallen in, Ah, neighbour, Christian, where are you now? And truly, said Christian, I do not know as he sank. It's not a bad metaphor for depression, actually. The more you struggle, the more you sink, I mean, there's something on your back, it's weighing you down, and it's quite hard to just explain what's going on. So I, you know, people in the 17th century may have expressed themselves in different ways, but they're just us, aren't they? Just people. So I'm going to think about this thing, the pit of depression, and, and what I'm going to put to you is that there are four rules about how the pit of depression works, about how people fall in and how people climb out. And by remembering these four rules, or maybe just remembering one of them, that may give us the trick that we need to prevent ourselves from falling in or if we're in, to help us to climb out, or if we're caring for another person to know how to extend the hand of help. I think it is worth thinking a little bit, though, about why. Why is it that multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease raise your risk of falling into this pit? Why is that? Part of the answer is the obvious answer, that multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease are a pretty raw deal. They're hard work. They're very stressful when the symptoms are strong. And they're demoralizing in lots of ways. So why wouldn't you expect that some of us might be so worn down by MS or Parkinson's that we become depressed? In the same way that depression is more common in people with severe arthritis compared to people without arthritis and it's more common in people with any kind of illness compared to people without illness. All right? So illness itself, of any kind, raises your risk of depression because it's a, it's a hard ride. It's stressful. It's hard work. It depletes our energy. It threatens our way of life. All these things. So that's true. But it turns out that lots of the brain diseases have an extra added risk compared to, say, a disease of your knee. And of course, bad arthritis in the knee can ruin your life. And there may be some people in the room right now that are living with you know, pretty difficult arthritis in your knee. But there's something extra about some of the brain conditions which tells us that it's not just about stress and how bad an experience these illnesses can be. There's also something about how these illnesses are affecting the brain that itself can cause a depression illness to come on us. These are brain diseases and depression is a brain condition. It's not just something that humans can get because they're stressed out and having a rough time, that is one way we can become depressed, isn't it? But there's something about the brain connections and how these diseases affect our brains that make it more likely. I'm not going to bore you with the details. I'm going to say that there are increasingly well understood biological reasons why having these illnesses can increase our risk of depression. So it's not just that it's a tough ride also brain changes can do it. Which I help hopes us. Uh, I hope helps <laughs> us because there's a sort of secret unwritten opinion 
which is so deeply in our culture that it hides in the back of our own minds, which is that if I become depressed, then probably it's, I'm, it's because of something to do with me. Maybe I am weak in some way. Because other people have gone through this experience and they don't get depressed, but I'm going through this experience and here I am. So it must be something to do with me. And if the only reason that MS and Parkinson's made depression more common, not inevitable by any means, but more common, then it would be very tempting to think that the difference between the people who get it and the people that don't is people that can handle stress and people that can't. That would be the temptation. Now there are two problems with that thinking, but it's so deeply in our heads that I myself think like this about myself. <coughs> Problem number one is that ignores that multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's are brain diseases, and that's got nothing to do with your moral fiber, has it? You've just, it's in your brain. It wasn't your fault, it's just there. So that's got nothing to do with how strong and tough and brave and whatever you are, nothing at all. It's to do with genes and brain cells and chemicals and viruses and you know things that are not, you, you can't do anything about them. The other thing that it ignores is what I think we all learned in Canterbury as part of the earthquakes. And that is that everyone has their limit. Some people collapsed like a house of cards on the day of the first earthquake. Maybe they were in that bus that got partially crushed by the blocks of masonry off one of the buildings and people were killed and that was enough to push them over and they just got really stressed out and anxious and maybe even depressed. Or maybe it was the person that was fine, they coped well with the earthquakes, but it was three weeks later when mum-in-law had had to move in for now three weeks, but she's really sick as well. And so we look after her and my kids and they're stressing out and not sleeping and having nightmares and actually I've lost my business and I don't know what we, you know, and it's at three weeks after the earthquakes that I'm now beginning to lose the plot. Or was it a year later when the roadworks are only just now starting on the street and I'm beginning my fight with the insurance company? Or was it five years later? when I got my house repaired, and then it was repaired a second time, and now they're telling me that that wasn't done right either, and I'm not allowed to sell it, but all I want to do is sell it and leave. You know, everyone has their limit. <coughs> all Cantabrians were at elevated risk of developing a depression after those earthquakes. It's just a question of how far were you pushed. And some of us weren't pushed to the end of our tether. Good for us that our tether was longer than this other person, but it wasn't an infinitely long tether, and if we'd kept on being pushed, we would have also fallen into the pit. So I just want to point that out, that arguments about stress causing depression and are some of us just weak and some of us are strong, miss the point that none of us are strong enough to guarantee that we won't fall into the pit. Not one of us. There's nothing different about the brains of people uh, who get depressed in their lifetime at least once and people that never get depressed in their lifetime. That means that the never depressed group, you know, it was all due to the, it was due to luck. They never met the situation that pushed them over the edge. That's all. Good. Good for them. I'm really pleased for them. Because I wouldn't wish depression on my enemy. I think it's just worth being clear why those of us in this room have a higher chance than some other people. It's not destiny, but it's not weakness either. Here are my four rules. Do you want to hear them? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Rule number one is this. There are many routes in to the pit of depression. 
and I'll give you the other half of rule one in a minute. Can you guess what it might be though? Yep. What, what are the roots in? What do you think are different things that can cause human beings to become depressed? Different experiences or different things that can do it. We've already talked about two brain diseases that affect how your brain is working and, and stress. It's just a question of how much and what type. What, what are some other ideas that you have? What are, what are some ways that you've heard of or seen with your own eyes, whether it's you or someone else, where roots in to becoming depressed for people? Lack of support and social. A lack of support and social connections. Okay, so that's a good one. Loneliness is a is a route into depression. Okay? And and not just loneliness, but lack of support, which is a slightly different concept. Like I can be very well connected, but after the birth of my first child, none of those connections are actually there for me. Like they don't get it that I'm really struggling with becoming a dad. And so there's no support, no practical support. But I've got lots of mates. You know, so there's, there's two slightly different ideas, the social connectedness and a lack of support, especially during times of stress. These are two roots into depression, aren't they? Those are social roots. They're to do with my social environment. Those are ways in. There was another comment over here somewhere. Like you said, loneliness. Yeah, loneliness, great. You know, that, so that's the same thing. Good. Any other social kind of things that you think could push a, a human, a, a person, towards depression? Economic. Yeah, poverty. Now you can think of that as a type of stress, but it's a very particular type of stress. And there may be some here today that are what, you know, you're not living under a bridge, but thinking about can I afford the food and the petrol and the rego this month, that is a real question. And there are many people in Christchurch who didn't have dinner last night because they couldn't afford to buy it. Not the majority, thank God, but there are people living in this city, and not a small number, for whom that is their reality. And living like that for months grinds you down. And that's a route into depression, that's a social route. Because people don't have to be poor. There are lots of really rich people in Christchurch. So there's something about the way we organize ourselves that makes this possible. All right, what else? What are some other social ways, do you think? Or things to do with our social lives? Yeah? Loss of someone close to you. Yeah, yeah. Death of a spouse. Or a mum or a dad or a brother or a sister or a best mate. Now, it's, it's normal to grieve, isn't it? And grieving hurts, and it's hard, and it goes on for quite a while. It's the price humans pay for love. And I wouldn't not have love, so grief is that's just part of the bargain. But not everyone experiences depression after someone dies, which is where the grief sets and grows into our lives and stops us from functioning for a long, long time. That's not normal. So that's hard, isn't it? Where's the line? Because you know, everyone's allowed to not cope after their partner dies and feel awful. But that shouldn't stop me from managing my life a year later. So somewhere there's a line that we cross between what is normal grief and what's actually becoming the illness of depression. Good. Get this out. Any big loss, basically, and some of these losses are social, like the loss of my job, either through unemployment or retirement, can do it. If I've invested all of myself in my job, and I, I, I don't actually have a second option, I'm a one-trick pony, and I go from being important, respected, and filled with meaning, to being unimportant, not respected, and having no meaning, over the space of a day. Like that's quite a shock to some of us. Some in the room may have experienced that. That's a, another route to depression. Good. So there's these social roots in, right? What about more personal, psychological roots in to do with my own story and my psychology? Like, what do you think?
think are some ways into depression there that you're aware of in the world? Fear and anxiety? Yeah, just if, if, if for whatever reason, is it genetic or is it what you've been through in your life, your anxiety and worry and fear circuits are set much higher than everyone else's, so you live on the edge a lot. Or worried a lot, not just a little, but a lot. It, that's hard, and eventually that's a route into depression because it just wears us down. Okay, so there's one route. Anyone else know or can describe from things they've seen in their lives of other kind of more personal psychological roots in? Yeah, family okay, family history. So, uh, and, and what we're talking about there, there's some of it is not genetic, but most of it is genetic. You know, there are genes for depression as well that put us more at risk or less at risk. But also there's a whole family culture that can get set up, which might not help us either. So family stuff. Especially if you don't like yourself. Yeah, not liking yourself. And where does that come from? You know, that's old. That's, that's from childhood. You know, let's lie back on the couch and tell me about your relationship with your parents stuff. You know? but, but it is. You know, it's right back to there. What was going on that laid these well-worn tracks, as one of my friends used to say, where the water just can so easily go down the depression channel rather than the happiness channel. Because of how we've built our minds. And mostly that's how they were built when we were one, two, three, and four. Okay, so there's psychological ways. You know, if, if I'm always critical about myself, or here's a good phrase, which I stumbled across a couple of weeks ago, which applies to me and may well apply to a lot of you, the self-assigned impossible task. If you've got a wee monkey that sits on your shoulder telling yourself, try harder, not good enough. Ah, you know, that's a root in. Perfectionism. Yeah, perfectionism. That's a root in. Because none of us can be perfect, it turns out. <laughs> okay, so there's some personal roots in. Can anyone think of some more spiritual roots in? If we think we've thought about personal, psychological, we've thought about social. What about spiritual roots? And I don't just mean religious, although that is... You know, because that's an important part of human spirituality, but there are many people who say, I'm quite a spiritual person, but I'm not a religious person. So can anyone think of some more spiritual roots or religious roots into depression? No hope or purpose for living? Yeah, losing a purpose for living. Losing hope. That's the meaning, you know. Why do I get out of bed in the morning? And if you lose that, that's a root into depression, isn't it? And, and that's a spiritual question. It's a big meaning of my life question. What's the point? All humans, I would think, struggle with that from time to time, but that's one root in. And some of these illnesses that we're talking about today really profoundly make us question, what's the point of me? It's quite a big question. But there are religious roots in too. Uh, you can think of them as social, but you know, if my community of faith rejects me for some reason, or if I feel, um, you know, if I believe in a personal God and I feel separated from God for whatever reason, sin or something, these are deep things and they are roots into depression. There are spiritual roots into depression too, but there are also biological roots into depression touched on them, haven't we? We've touched on maybe my genes could have something to do with it, and they do. We've touched on maybe brain diseases might do something to the brain that makes it more likely to be depressed, and they do. Not destiny, but they raise our risk. But there are heaps of other biological ways in. You know, did you know that if your calcium levels in your blood are too high for too long, that can just cause depression? Don't worry, you won't get there by taking vitamin D and drinking milk. <laughs> it's, not, it's not possible. But there are some diseases that can raise your calcium levels too high for too long and, and 
and a proportion of those people become depressed, hypothyroidism causes depression. Pancreatic cancer causes depression even before you know you've got it. You know, there's chemical things going on, right? So there's biological roots in. Now, so far, so obvious in a way, there's lots of ways in. But just think about the implications of this for a minute, because we're talking about depression. That's a very feelings and thoughts experience. It's in our minds. And yet we've just said what can push you into that mind state are chemicals from your pancreas or relationships with other people or ways of thinking or other social things like becoming retired. Or whatever. Like All these biological, spiritual, social, psychological roots in, but they all produce this thing at the end. They can produce this thing, which looks the same as depression thing. So there are many roots in. That's a bit depressing. <laughs> and you know, here are some of the ones that we've just talked about. But the point of spending so much of this talk canvassing those ways in is that each of them is also a way out. And not just from taking that thing and reversing it, like, oh, your calcium's too high, let's lower your calcium, right? That's, mm -hmm. That sounds obvious, and that can work. But it's more than that. It's not just trying to reverse that thing mm -hmm. is the way out. It's there are biological ways out. There are spiritual ways out. There are social roots out. There are psychological roots out. So it's more of a concept thing. Can anyone think of a psychological root out of depression? What's a psychological sort of thing that can help people get out of the pit? Yeah. Hope. Yeah, you might even say that I mean, it's, it is psychological. It's also a spiritual thing. You know, it, it, I've, I, I know I'm going to be okay. Yeah? Yes, sir? Having good affairs. Goal setting. Goal setting, sorry. And another one? Having good affairs to you make success. Sorry? Nothing good or bad as thinking makes it so. Right. No, there's nothing good or bad as thinking makes it so. So the way we think about things, goal setting, is, is, a, is a very practical, pragmatic. The trick with goal setting, though, isn't it? It's always to pick achievable goals, yeah. <coughs> but goals that slightly stretch us. Right? So that you don't, when you've ticked it off, go, well, I knew I could do that anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be, I think I can do that. I did it. You know, so it gives you that wee burst as well. But yes, goal setting is absolutely a route out of depression. Did you know it's a psychological treatment? Why you need to pay someone $150 an hour once a week to do it? But it is literally setting increasingly tricky goals for yourself that are practical so they're not irrelevant goals like I can you know do a headstand they're goals that actually help you get off your sick bed and moving again in the world but but they're graded carefully so that they increase the sense of pleasure I have on a chair <coughs> and they increase the sense of mastery I have over my own life and you simply draw a grid and start rating goals and pleasure and mastery and that's all you do and that is an effective treatment for some people for depression interesting okay so there are these psychological roots out and they're not all psychotherapy but some of them are so simply sitting down with another knowledgeable person who's, who's good at this to talk through what's happening to you and try and find different ways of dealing with it is a treatment for depression that is quite effective. Good. These are psychological roots out.
Can you think of any social routes out of depression? Joining a group. Joining a group. As simple as that. It's got to be the right group. You know, it's a bit like goal setting. It's got to be a group where you feel included and supported as a person. Like, you you really are welcome. You're not tolerated. You're welcome. You know, it's got to be the right kind of group. And not one like, you know, for those of us that are anxious, the group that you're going to join probably won't be Toastmasters. You know, <laughs> you'll, you'll think of the right group for you. Is it a craft group? Is it, is it what kind of group is it? Is it a walking group? Is it a, a men's head? What, what, what is the group? Is it a provis, a service group? Is it a church group? What group? You know, is it this group? You know, so joining a group, for some people, that's all it takes, but it's not going to work immediately, but gradually over the months, that's how I clamber out. All right? Can anyone think of some other social routes out? Exercising with someone? Yeah. So exercising, but with another person. That's the social aspect of it. Just having, just having coffee with your friend. Yeah. Just coffee with a friend makes you feel better. One of the tricks, uh, and I'm speaking to the men in the room now because you're the ones that don't get it, like me. When someone just wants to sit down with you and get that support, they're not generally after a problem-solving exercise. They, they don't want suggestions of solutions to problems. They just want you to listen and go, gosh, that, yeah, that, is, that was not fair. Yeah, that is right. Oh my goodness, I don't know how you're managing with that. Gosh, that's awful. Oh no. They, they just want to share it. Yeah? People want to share it. Now, problem solving is another route out. You know, I've got a whole lot of stresses. I'm overwhelmed. don't know how to deal with them. How wonderful that I can sit down with my excellent, you know, mum or partner or dad or whatever and go, look, should we make a list of them? All right, let's, let's pick the most urgent one, deal with that, and then we'll, you know, great, good, good stuff, problem solving stuff, but actually, the real money <coughs> of just having coffee with people is just having coffee with people and just sharing about what it's like, and then, but that's the intervention. You know that old saying, don't just stand there, do something. You know that old saying? Well, it's only half the story, right? I spend a lot of my time telling medical teams, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> or sit there. Stop, stop rushing around, headlessly be chopped. And just sit down with that person in that bed. What they really need is half an hour of your time once a day at the moment. It's really what they need. So sometimes it's about don't just do something, stand there. It's a really good phrase, I find that helpful myself. What about spiritual roots out of depression? We've talked about hope and meaning, getting a purpose in life, picking a, a hobby, goal, aim, something, but also just feeling, yeah, there is hope, there is light on the horizon, you can, I can recover. That's all very helpful. You want to think of other spiritual or religious roots out of for some people. Just walking it with nature. Yeah, so for those of us that nature is our temple, right? My church is the top of a, a mountain, you know, that kind of approach to a beautiful world that we live in, just being out in it is helpful. The Japanese are um, a fascinating culture for so many reasons, but one of their greatest inventions uh, for the world is the concept of forest bathing. I don't know if you've heard of this, go and Google it, fantastic. So the idea is that if you're feeling worn down and stressed and sick in the middle of Tokyo, you need to hop on a train and go to a forest and bathe, which just means you sit there. Breathing in, I love this, that there's the idea that it could be chemical. There are pinenes, did you know, from pine trees? So you've got to breathe in those pinenes. I'm not so sure about the chemistry of it myself, but I think it's great just to be in nature. And if you Google it again, I you know, just such a fascinating culture.
told you, you can get a ranking of the top forests in order in Japan <laughs> that are good for forest bathing. I went to the second best forest in Japan for forest bathing. <laughs> All right, so just getting into nature is a, is a thing that can help some of us. Prayer, meditation, um, joining a community of faith, reading the Bible, reading our sacred book. What, these are other routes out for people. And they actually work for people. So rule one of the pit of depression, and the one I wanted to spend the most time on, is that there are many routes in, but there are also many routes out. But don't forget the biological, which includes antidepressants. It's just one of many. Here's rule two. The deeper the hole, the more steps you need to get out. So if this is a really big, bad depression, it's a very deep hole, then one idea, one of those blue methods to get out will not be enough. You'll need two or three or four or five. And by the time people are coming to see me with their depressions, I'm talking about psychotherapy and a medication and some exercise and some diet and some social support. And, you know, I'm talking about, let's just throw a few books at you. Yeah, because if it had been, take one of these every morning for a month and you'll be right, they wouldn't be coming to see me. Yeah, some people do get better from take one of these every morning for a month and you'll be fine. Great! Some people get better from go to this counsellor for three months, once a week, you'll be right. Great! But for some of us, the deeper the hole, we need several things to get out. It's demoralising when you're depressed or sick for any reason, and someone says, treatment X will help you, and you try treatment X, and you don't feel better. It's very demoralising. But oftentimes, treatment X has been helpful, but like this drawing, it's only lifted me a little way up, and so I still can't lift my head over the edge of the pit, and it's still as dark as it was before. I just need another blue arrow, and then another one. But the first one wasn't useless, so don't give up on it. You know, like exercise. I'm exercising. I'm following all the... I'm being good. But I still feel awful. Doesn't mean that the exercise didn't work. It means that by itself the exercise didn't work. What's rule three? The particular route that you followed or the person you care about followed to fall into the pit. So I followed a biological route in. This is all to do with the way Parkinson's has affected my brain. So I, I fell into this hole for biological reasons only. Or I fell into this hole for psychological <coughs> reasons only. I've always been a stress bunny, and this was one stress too many. No judgment, just that's my route. Or what about a spiritual route? I was doing fine until I realized that I would have to stop driving. And what that meant, for some reason, that was like the final straw. I could accept that I had to stop working and I could accept somehow that I was no longer the breadwinner in the family, but I could not accept the loss of my driver license. Then I just felt like a kid again and not like an adult. You know? That was my route. But the route in does not decide the route out. And this is very important. If you fell into, if I fell into the pit of depression because of a spiritual crisis in my life, I lost my faith, and for various reasons, and now I'm depressed, <coughs> that does not mean that my only way out is a spiritual route out. I've got to find a replacement meaning in life. That may well be very helpful, but it is not 
not my only route out, and it may not even be the best one. If I fell into the pit of depression because I lost all purpose and meaning in my life, that does not mean I need psychotherapy to get out. I need to learn a different way of thinking about myself and not be so judged hard on myself and blah, blah, blah. That might be very helpful. That might work for me. But it, it's not written in stone. One of the most important things, in my opinion, to come out of the last 50 years of psychiatry research is to kill the idea, and it's been thoroughly killed, that if you become depressed because of psychological reasons, the only way you can get better is with psychological treatment. And if you fell into the pit for biological reasons, the only way out is biological. Psychotherapy works for people who are depressed because of how Parkinson's has affected their brain. Antidepressants work for people who are depressed who got there because they have an, a terrible super judging super ego that sits on their shoulder, which is their internalized representation of their dreadful mother. Your route in does not predict your route out. In fact, there is no evidence in general that there's any relationship between the two. Isn't that interesting? Rule four. This one's going an ounce of prevention, which also includes just building up the well being in my life. And I think when we talk about prevention in a Western, you know, European New Zealand cultural setting, we're thinking about kind of medical prevention things like boosting my vitamin B12, blah, blah, blah. No. There's much better ways of thinking about this. And in particular, there's an even better thing to do than thinking about what can I do to prevent depression? That's all right. What can I do to prevent dementia? That's all right. But what's even better is to think, what can I do to boost my general health and well-being? That's even better. It'll cover prevention of depression and of dementia and prevention of cancer and prevention of all kinds of things, but I'm not actually trying to put all my efforts into preventing these nasty things. I'm putting all my efforts into building the positive rather than minimizing the negative. But it'll do the same job. And this is the concept that we get from Māori culture with a focus on hōra, on well-being, not on treating illness. And it's also a concept uh, which is significantly different from our European way of thinking, that you don't just think about the person, you have to think about the family. So it's whānau order, family well-being, not your illness prevention. That is the way that a traditional Māori approach would go. That's quite different from the way a traditional European New Zealand way would go thinking, do I need to take vitamins and boost myself up? Should I be exercising? You know, those are all good things. <coughs> but focusing more on just boosting the well-being and the positive stuff. And for us all in our household and in our extended family, is even more powerful. I see this with one of my friends who has a huge problem with depression for all kinds of reasons. And one of the drivers for this person is that his diet is terrible. It's the diet of a, of a teenager, but he's 54. Yeah, so he's now obese and got type 2 diabetes, and, and it's just crap food. But to change his diet, how do you do that when you've got four kids and a partner? Everyone's diet has to change. It's the only way. 
because that's the phase of life. But is it, do you, so do you see how an individual focus is sort of nonsense? Like, what are you saying? That he should have a separate, he should join Jenny Craig? Was I mean, maybe. But it would be much better, wouldn't it, if the whole family said, how's our diet going? Is that good for us? Can we all, do, can we all stop the soft drink addiction? that look like and, and you can see even from an individual's perspective that's going to fly better for me isn't it because there just won't be soft drink in the fridge so i won't get it because no <coughs> one's getting it because we've decided we're going to do something different or what if the family says we're going to we're going to exercise more we are going to exercise more well, that's far better then I'm going to go out for this walk, but Dad, I need you, no, I'm doing my walk now. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of hopeless, isn't it, we, if we can do it. So, anyway, that's a, a, a long talk about whole order and whanau order approaches, but an ounce of prevention is indeed worth a ton of cure. So, all these roots out of depression, <coughs> You know, good diet, exercise, social connections, meaning and purpose, all these things. They, these just enhance our lives, don't they? You know, good vitamins, all these biological things. Having my Parkinson's and MS symptoms under the best control possible. These are all roots out of depression. You know, being part of a community of faith, being having a big meaning and purpose in my life, sorting out this ridiculous way of thinking I've been thinking since I was a kid and getting rid of that monkey on my back. Great stuff, just to enhance your quality of life and make life better. That will help protect us from depression. But that's not the goal. The goal is just to make my life better. But that will protect us from falling like Christian and pliable into the slough of the spot. They're pretty simple rules. Many ways in, but many ways out deeper the pit, the more things, more of these things I'll need to get out. The way I got in does not predict the way I get out. And prevention is worth a ton of cure. But the key to that is to just work to put healthy stuff and fun stuff and good stuff into my life rather than just be focusing on preventing terrible things from happening to me one day. <coughs> Much better to just think about well-being. So we started this talk uh, by admitting that anyone can fall into the pit of depression. They can. But some of us in this room have already done it, and we've come out the other side. I'm out the other side at the moment. That's good. Um, if you're in it, you will get out the other side at some point, and what I really hope is it's sooner rather than later. She's a hard road, being in that pit. And, but we admitted that Parkinson's and MS raise our risk a bit. They do. It's just part of, part of the deal. Uh, and we admitted that being a, a, a care partner, you know, it's my mum, it's my dad, it's my husband, it's my wife, it's my best friend, that that raises our risk too, because that's hard road as well, right? The disease affects one person, it's in the brain of one person, but it affects a, a whole network. We, we all have to live with it. And I'm not blaming the person, I'm blaming the disease. You know, Parkinson's, yeah, beast. You know, the whole family's got you sitting in the chair in the corner. Wish you weren't here. So I've just just been honest about the fact that we are at a bit of a higher risk. So it's worth knowing these four rules about the pit of depression because they can help us to protect ourselves, to help each other with a helping hand, to not give up, uh, and to also just prevent ourselves from ever falling in in the first place. So ladies and gentlemen, that's all I had prepared and wanted to talk to you about. The sun is setting on the talk. Oh, oh, actually, the sun is rising, because that's the pier. Oh, yes. The sun is rising. It's a new tomorrow. Are there any things that anyone wants to quiz or question me about before we wrap up? Yes, sir. There's one thing I want to do is if you're in a hole, stop digging. Yeah. <laughs> yep. 
Because sometimes the, the root, the, the, the comment was, if you're in a hole, stop digging. You know, these are, are like um, turns of phrase. You know, we all know. Um, uh, we usually apply that one when we notice someone is digging themselves a bigger hole. And, you know, that <coughs> can sometimes be the trick to getting out, is to, is to say, you might not have realized this, but I think that this thing that you're doing is making this worse. And in my game, the, the commonest thing that is making uh, the pit of depression worse uh, when there's MS or Parkinson's, and in fact in general, is when simultaneously to trying to get out, I'm using too much alcohol, which is a central nervous system depressant, and I cure a number of my people from depression simply by asking them to try a dry July for a whole month. Just give it a go. You say it's not that important to you. How wonderful. Good. So you won't mind if we do a dry July in March. Why don't we do that? And just see how you go. So that could be the key. That could be it. And that's a way that we keep digging ourselves down without even realising. Because, you know, it's not like we're alcoholic and it's not like we're drunk every night and that's not it at all. That's just a bit too much for a break. You know, so there's an example. Or, or maybe I'm digging my hole by... That my problem is this monkey on my back that says I'm useless, but I'm digging my hole by making myself more stressed, by taking on more jobs for more people, to be like Jesus for everybody, and it's actually, this is not a possible thing. I'm digging my own grave. So I'm digging. Great comment. Any other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, any particular food that could help with depression? Okay, so... Great question. So in terms of the, the nutrition ways out of depression, are there any specific foods? So there are three keys. One is, am I getting enough food of any type? So just, is there enough fuel coming into my body? And at its most extreme, the treatment for depression and anorexia is sandwiches easier said than done, right? But you can't be non-depressed if your weight falls too low. So, just enough nutrition. And for Parkinson's in particular, and severe MS, when it's getting to the stage where often from medication side effects as well as from the disease itself, I'm finding it hard to feed myself, then my weight starts to go down and I can become depressed in that state, and one of the treatments is how can we help you to just have more calories? How nice to be thinking, how can I add calories today? Okay, so just enough of anything, that's one thing. But for most of us, that's not the big deal. The second thing is there are some micronutrients, so like vitamins, which are particularly important for getting out of the whole of depression or getting into it. And oftentimes when we're depressed, our GP does some blood tests. And one of those tests is to look at a couple of vitamins and minerals. So iron is one thing, and vitamin B12 and folate are two others, which are ways of getting into the pit or finding it hard to get out. And so foods that will boost that, or vitamin supplements that will boost that, is the second key. Now the third key is unexpected and yet so obvious. It's not a type of food, it's what do you enjoy eating? What do you like? How can we make meal time, which is hard enough when you're depressed, better by just having things that you quite like? The things that will make you go, oh, goody, you know, and have a little bit more appetite <coughs> than the days where you look at it and you're just saying, mm. where eating becomes a jolly. And that's not just about the type of food, it's who am I eating with? Where am I eating? What music is on? Did I cook it myself? Did I make an effort like I would if a guest was coming? Or did I just throw something together and I'm telling myself that I'm barely worth it? You know, it's put, putting that energy into making the meal good. So there's no food that treats depression as far as we know, and yet there are some micronutrients that are good, it's important to have enough. And the most important thing 
is that the whole experience is something in the day two or three times that's actually really nice. Good question. That doesn't do anything to stop. I haven't eaten my lunch yet. Half <laughs> <laughs> uh, And I'm sure that's going to improve my well being. So thank you very much for coming along today. And once again, uh, just my um, my uh, strong uh, aroha and uh, hats off to those of you that are currently in trouble or that are helping someone who's having trouble with depression. I know what it's like personally and from helping folks. It's not good. So keep struggling on because the four rules might help you to make some movement out. Don't lose hope. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. Thank, thank you. you.